52 years ago, when I was 21, I came to the Illinois Institute for Technology. It was, uh, it's the other campus. I was a young student at Mississippi State. This was 1966, when Chicago was uh, racked with uh, controversy over the fair housing movement. And I remember that vividly because that conference, which was my first time to ever fly on an airplane uh, to get here, uh, it was your typical 1960s student conference. Three of us decided to go down to the Liberty Baptist Church in the south side of Chicago on the elevated train to hear Dr. Martin Luther King that evening give a exhortation to about a thousand people in the church for the march that would be held the next day into, uh, I think it was Gage Park then. The original Mayor Daly was the mayor then, and there were important negotiations going on. Anyway, I got to go and see this wonderful event, historic event, and, and it's all on account of the Illinois Institute of Technology and the conference that you held back then uh, for students uh, in August, last week of August, 1966. So it's wonderful to be back. I thank you for letting me be part of the program. I sat through every panel so far and said to myself, these are experts. These people know patent law and they know uh, copyright law. And I am a fraud. You know, uh, what am I doing here? I am just a district judge. Uh, in any given week, any this last week, take it as an example, I had two important sentencings of child pornography, the mandatory minimums, the uh, uh, Title VII cases, employment cases, Social Security appeals where somebody didn't get their Social and it, uh, those have nothing to do with IP. And yet, uh, and then I'm now expected to come and tell this audience of experts who really know your stuff, uh, something about IP. So you can imagine how I feel. I, I decided, though, I do have one thing that I've learned in my 73 years of life uh, about IP that I feel it really, it really bears on me, and I think it's something I would like to share with you. And that's the most important thing, summarized basically as a, a plague on innovation. Uh, Unlike many of you who, who apparently very much believe in the patent system, I feel it's a plague on innovation. I see it in almost every case. And I'm going to go through and explain to you in some detail why me, as just a lowly district judge, uh, sees it this way. Now, you might ask, well, how does the Supreme Court fit in? What does this guy down at the bottom of the pyramid know about the top of the pyramid? Uh, I do, uh, I am going to have a slide or two that shows you what I would call the Supreme Court comes to the rescue. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's where the Supreme Court part of this is going to fit in. Now, one reason I didn't, feel comfortable making this presentation was because you are the experts and I'm not. But uh, the other one is that every time I do make one of these speeches, someone uses it to try to disqualify me from the case. <laughs> so I need to make it very clear. The views I'm giving you are my professional views. My views as somebody who's lived long enough to see a little history of this country. And, and they are I, but I do follow the law. If I don't agree with a decision by the federal circuit, too bad for me. I follow it anyway because I took an oath to follow the law. And I try to be fair to both sides, even if I think one of them is a total abuser of the system. I, I still am, I follow the law and I give both sides their fair hearing. Nevertheless, uh, I think I wouldn't be doing my job as a judge if I didn't step back every now and then 
and say to you, or say to anyone willing to listen, here's how the system ought to be fixed. So for those of you who feel this is a great system, I, I don't know how you ever came to that conclusion. I, I, honestly, I feel it's out of control, it's, uh, uh, it's a mess, and I'm going to go through some slides in a minute. But let's look at it from the point of view of the poor district judge down who has child pornography, a guy who, who the government wants to put away for 135 months, and then I have to go to a case where they want me to construe 135 claims. And, uh, and, and my heart sinks that, uh, that it would be like that. But uh, look at this chart. This is the steady march upward of our district court in California, where I, where I sit, San Francisco, and goes all the way back to 1981, and how the, it's steadily, steadily, steadily going up, up, up. Now, why is that? Well, the, uh, I'm going to come to that, and I'm going to explain to you the then and now. Most of you are too young to remember the then part, so I want to explain it to you. I, bet, how, how, I want to ask you how old you are, but I can just see how old you are. You, you're, you were born after that event I just talked about in 1966, uh, and you weren't uh, old enough to remember it. But when I started practicing in the 70s, and, and uh, even in the, to the early 80s in uh, San Francisco, when you heard about a patent case, it, it was always a boutique type thing. Uh, it, uh, law firms like my firm, Morrison and Forrester, we didn't have any patent. We referred the patent cases to uh, one of the, there were only two, one of the two patent boutique firms in San Francisco because they knew the arcane ins and outs of patent law and we didn't know any of that stuff. We were trial lawyers, we were not patent lawyers. So there were very few patent cases in the system in those days. And the second thing about it was, it was if there was one, it was typically a competitor suing a competitor. Somebody had stolen their idea or they sto stolen their invention, uh, and it was that it was that kind of a case. Uh, but two two people who are actually trying to manufacture something or provide a service to the public, uh, and one of them had a patent and was trying to enforce it against the other side. The other thing is that uh, you only got, usually there was one patent. It's true there were some gigantic cases with more than one, one patent. I, I acknowledge that. But the typical case was one patent, maybe two, uh, two or three claims would be asserted. And then there would be a bench trial because in those days the lawyers didn't uh, trust juries. So the... Uh, what happened was they would say, okay, they, I don't know why they would trust the judges anymore, but I guess they felt like uh, it was easier to try a case in front to the bench as opposed to trying it to a jury. So there, was, there were almost always bench trials, and then the judge would make findings of fact that would go up on appeal to a different court, then, and, and it would go up to your circuit court. So those appeals went to the Ninth Circuit in, in those days. And then it would be, instead of uh, uh, one patent owners suing uh, what may turn out to be 60 or 70 different infringers, you would, it would typically just be one other defendant and that would be the case. So, so that, was the, that was the pattern. Well, starting about, in fact, I remember the conversation at, at my uh, ex-firm. I remember a fellow named Mike Jacobs. A lot of you may know him as a good friend. He went on a couple of those backpacking trips with me. And Mike said, we ought to start an intellectual property group. So why would we do that? So, well, this is the new thing. So he explained to me about the federal circuit and how the federal circuit was going to revamp the law and, and it, it, there was going to be all this patent litigation. I said, oh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> so, so then, so now we come to the now. Well, it did happen. It did happen. And now uh, our, we have huge caseloads uh, of patent cases. And these are mostly non-practicing entity cases. I would say 90% are in that category of the cases. And the word portfolio has now come into the 
to the lexicon. Now, here's the way that comes. I find this very interesting. You see, in the old days, they would write you a letter and say, we got the 719 patent. And we've looked at your motor, and you infringe our 719, specifically claim one reads as follows, and here's how you infringe. And they would send that letter and tell them to cease and desist. And if they didn't, they'd go to court. Well, now what happens is the non-practicing entity sends a letter that says, we have a portfolio of patents that cover motors or, or analog to digital conversion or whatever this uh, power supplies. And you have power supplies, so undoubtedly you infringe somewhere one of our patents. Therefore, you would be well advised to get a license from us. Well, it actually turns out sometimes the uh, recipient of that letter will say, it's, it's better just to pay them the money. Uh, let's just pay them the money. And we'll get the portfolio. <clears throat> but some of them, every now and then, they will fight, and it winds up in court. And it turns out they have done zero homework. They're just hoping somewhere in that portfolio they can find a patent that actually does cover the motor. So that's what I see. Uh, so we, the case starts with a portfolio being asserted. It's, they don't even name the, the patents. There may be a dozen patents in the, in the quote, portfolio, but they don't, they don't call them out by name. One of the reasons I figured it out, why they don't call it out by name, because if you call it out by name, it makes it easier for the other side to go in for declaratory relief. So if you stay vague, it may not be enough of a threat to warrant declaratory relief. So I think that's part of the strategy behind the portfolio approach. Okay, then uh, the next difference is a jury trial is always asked for. Because why? Because it's, it's all of the advantages, at least in the 80s and the 90s, all of the, all of the advantages were with the patent holder. You got to start with that wonderful document with the red ribbon and the seal. How many times did I see that show go on? I, I, I've seen it several, it's in every patent case. You get to seal, and what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that the, an expert, an expert in the patent office decided that we had an invention. And after we got the invention, who stole it? That guy. So that's the way it always kind of goes. And, and so the, the, uh, the jury is saying, look, that gold seal, this is a patent. And the expert says they infringe. I have a little aside here in the Waymo trial, which was in, uh, we, we actually settled on the fifth day of trial, so it didn't go all the way to the end. Uh, surprisingly, it settled. I, thought, I was very anxious to see how that would come out. But we had a jury there. And I told the press, because it was attended by, we had this many people in the courtroom every day that there was a hearing and an overflow room. I said at one of the hearings about three months before the trial, I said, is anybody here from the press? Well, about 20 people raised their hand. <clears throat> I said, I want you to know something. When we pick the jury, you pay attention to which side uses their peremptory challenges to knock off the people who understand science. I said, I don't know who it is in this case yet, but I have learned the hard way, not the hard way, I've just learned from experience that one side or the other will be afraid to have anybody on the jury that can understand the science. And sure enough, when the day came, there were several people on that jury, three particularly, and one side, I won't name who, used all three peremptories to knock those people off the jury. Oddly enough, though, only one newspaper person reported that, I th even though I had laid it out there on a silver platter. The, so, but what I'm telling you is it try, ties into the jury thing. One side is not going to want anyone on the jury. They want somebody that they can bamboozle. Uh, they want to knock the people off who could actually understand the patent and understand the science and understand where the motor uses 
uh, whatever it is that the motor uses. So, uh, all right, that's enough on the jury trial. So we get jury trials now instead of bench trials. And then the other major difference is that the owner, if it's a non-practicing entity, will sue everyone in the industry who has analog to digital conversion or who has, uh, who has uh, a motor and or power supply on the theory that somewhere in your product you will infringe one of the many patents we have in our portfolio. So that's kind of that's kind of where the uh, the difference between then and now. Now back in the uh, back when I had that conversation with my friend Mike Jacobs in the late '80s at, at Morrison and Forrester when he said, "Look, we uh, uh, we need to have an IP department." The whole idea of a non-practicing entity hadn't even developed yet. Uh, what had uh, in those days it still was competitor against mainly competitor against uh, competitor. All right. So what accounts for this? Uh, I, think, I think in fairness, I have to say that part of why the upward trend exists is really the advance of technology in, in America. Uh, we uh, have seen with the, the growth of the computer and the uh, Microsoft and the software and the, uh, the, the iPhone, Apple, uh, the, that whole industry did not exist in 1983. The computer industry existed, but but the, that app, that, those wonderful applications were still in the future. And so there has been a march of technology. And so that has uh, caused people to want to get in on the action, I guess. And so, so technology itself has improved. That would, in turn, create more patents, I guess. And so you, you, that, that would be a natural thing. So I think we have to say part of the upward trend in patent litigation is attributable to simply the fact that in America we've had uh, great strides in technology. The pharmaceutical industry is another one. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that there, there's at least uh, one, other, one other cause, and that is that the two, two other causes. Uh, the first is that the PTO let me, let me instead start with the, uh, the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit was enacted in 1982. It took all the jurisdiction on patent cases to one court, the Federal Circuit, the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, they allowed me to sit with them by designation uh, once. And I want to tell you, they were wonderful. Uh, the, the, as, as colleagues and the uh, care that they put into the decisions. I just, I just felt honored to be, to be part of that process. But I believe that it has been, uh, over time, a pro-patent court, pro-IP court, a pro-in-favor of uh, intellectual property court. And th that that is somehow a very uh, subtle bias that uh, creeps into to the opinions. Uh, whether or not that's true or not, bias is too strong a word. I don't mean it, I don't mean it that way. I just think that's the way they saw their their job was to strengthen the patent system. Uh, at the time in 1982, uh, there was a view in this country, and I think in Congress, that foreign countries were stealing our crown jewels, and so that the Federal Circuit was going to stop that through the patent system. I I believe that's that was the the. Uh, prevailing view at the time. So maybe they felt like by, by uh, strengthening the patent system, it would be, um, it would give America a uh, hand up uh, in dealing with uh, competition abroad. Whatever the reason, uh, the Federal Circuit strengthened the hand of the patent holder at the expense of the accused infringer. And that then, I believe, was one of the contributing factors that led to the view among uh, litigators that uh, holding a patent was a great thing. It was presumed valid, and it could only be overcome by clear and convincing evidence. And you had that red ribbon, and you could get an expert. Uh, these days, you can get an expert to say anything, uh, uh, and they, they will testify that there's infringement. So that's, that was one factor. But even more than that factor is this. I want to I say that I have some, I, I don't 
think I'm an expert on technology. I do have a mathematics degree, and I have an engineering mechanics minor. I uh, have the highest FCC license allowed by law for amateur radio. I can, I can tell you how radio works and how those components work and what they do for a living. I do understand those things. I still don't think I'm qualified as an expert in, in court, but I, I, I have an aptitude for understanding these patents. If I read it and study it and get some help from the lawyers, I can understand it. Some judges will not even, I don't know if they won't even try. I think they try, it's just, it's just so hard, such a hard thing that they, but I think I understand them. And I am convinced to a moral certainty that 40% of the decisions made by the, uh, the examiners in the PTO, they put 40% of those patents should never have been issued in the first place, 40%. Another 40% looked to me pretty good. They looked like they they really did have a worthwhile improvement to, to warrant it, and another 20% kind of a gray area. Maybe very weak patents, but but think about that. Uh, that we have a, if that's true, if it's true that 40%, and I think this is what the IPR uh, data is br proving out, that it's pretty close to 40%. I've been saying 40% before the American Invents Act uh, came along and before IPR came along. But I think the IPR is proving out that the number of bogus patents is in that category of 40%. Well, think about that. If we got an agency with a hit ratio that, 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 that that's poor, that that many mistakes are being made. Well, these, these flooded, millions of these patents flooded out there. And, and then, so that's probably the most important thing is millions of bogus patents flooded, flooded into the system and then they were asserted against the people who really are doing the innovation in this country. I'm, you know, think about the, the companies, I, won't, I shouldn't name names, so I won't, but they're people who invest tens of millions of dollars in a single project, and they put engineers on it, and they work hard, many of those are failures. Some of them wind up developing a great product. They'd go through trial and error. They spend a lot of time and effort of, for real innovation with engineering, which is the application of science to, to make it practical, to, to do something good with uh, science is, is what engineering is. And these engineers get in there and they, they do it. It's like the people that built the atomic bomb in uh, World War II. The, it was an impossibility, most people thought, to get that done. But, but engineers were able to, to, through innovation, trial and error, they got that done. Well. Many of these patents are invented by some, are invented, are written by somebody sitting at their kitchen table, with a playing around on a computer and doing a little internet research, and and they have done nothing. They have invested nothing except that that, that amount of time, and yet the PTO gives them the, that red ribbon, and to me it's something wrong with uh, with that system that would allow that. So. Uh, so the, uh, uh, that, that leads us to the American Invents Act, which uh, uh, in, enacted the uh, PTAB and created the PTAB and created the IPR process. And at the time, in 2011, when that happened, I said, this is, prob this is pretty good. I, I hope this works because this will weed out a lot of those bogus patents that we, uh, that have flooded the system and are being asserted against the people who are doing the real innovation in this country. Uh, and I think that's proven to be the case. I think uh, the, uh, the death ratio for these bogus patents has been pretty high and it's been right around 40%. I, I, I can't prove that to you right now, but I believe if you did the math, you would, you would uh, find that to be true. So, now let me go back to the federal circuit part. The Supreme Court has had a different view of the patent law than the federal circuit. And I want to break it down in two ways. This is, where the, this is what I call the Supreme Court comes to the rescue. This, if you look at the, uh, these are all patent cases taken by the Supreme Court since 1990. And the red ones are where the federal circuit was reversed Green ones are where they were affirmed. And the ratio is, what, 32 to 12. And 
that uh, tells us that the Supreme Court has a different view than the Federal Circuit. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that I, I personally and professionally happen to agree that the, the pendulum went way too far on the side of the patent holder, but that you don't need to agree with me or not. But I do believe the Supreme Court has had that view and has tried to uh, put more balance into the into our system. So I didn't. I don't have a slide on what I'm about to say, but it tracks pretty closely uh, this. Uh, I asked my law clerk about, after I got on the airplane, I said, go back through all those cases and tell me which uh, ones came out for the patent holder in the Supreme Court and which ones came out for the accused infringer. And so the uh, it was almost, again, 32 to 12. Now, it was 30 to 12. There were quite a number. There were some that you just couldn't uh, decide one way or the other. It didn't even it didn't it didn't involve an issue that was that easy to categorize. So I, I said, just give me the ones that are clear cut, and and it was thirty to twelve. So roughly seventy percent of the decisions are going against the patent holder, and only about thirty percent are going for the patent holder in the Supreme Court during that that same period of time. So I think that's that's pretty good pretty good uh, slide to show that. The Supreme Court has a different view of our patent system than, than does the uh, Federal Circuit. Now, on the uh, so this comes down to nevertheless, what does how can us district judges possibly manage this huge burden of IP cases today? And I'm going to give you a, give you a couple of answers. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, look at the IPR institution rates. Uh, they've been going down a little bit, but it's still, what does that say, 60%? 60% where they've given a decision, they're instituting the IPR. And then in a fair number of those, they are actually invalidating one or more of the claims in, in, the, in the patents. This is too, too much information in that, but, I, I, uh, but that's how the IPR has worked out since it came online in uh, 2012, I guess. Okay, so how can a district judge possibly manage a huge burden of IP cases today? Issue stay pending IPR. Now, I want you to know something. When I first started this job, before the IPRs came along, uh, I don't like grass growing under my feet. So if we had a patent case, I gave them a schedule and I... I worked hard to keep them on track. They had to work hard. We went to trial and then the, the, the defendant would always come in and say, we've moved for re-examination. We've moved for re-examination. Stay the case. I said, no way. So this, because in those days, those re-exams, I think it was like 13% hit ratio. Uh, the re-exams almost never uh, resulted in anything being disqualified or, or thrown out. So I said, I'm not going to do it. We're going to move right ahead. And you can make, you make your case to the jury. So, so I, I did. That was my view. No delay. We're going to go right on and go to go to trial. However, uh, and and I kind of had that same idea when the IPRs started, but but the the when it became clear that the so many were being invalidated uh, through the uh, PTAB, uh, it was foolish for me to continue uh, to to push ahead. So I have now flipped over and I issue a stay pending IPR almost always when, when, when one is, has been granted, or instituted is the word, I guess. When it's been instituted, I will, I will say, okay, we're going to wait and see what the PTAB does. So, uh, and then it gets complicated if, well, because in these cases they assert a multitude of patents. Do you stay everything or do you just stay the one that's in the instituted? Well, it depends. You have to you have to sort it out as to how overlapping they are and how much discovery would be duplicated, and so it's not quite it's quite so clear. But at least on the ones that are in the IPR stay, uh, that's where I am now, and I think that works pretty good. But but the uh, that only takes care of a certain percentage of the cases, so I still have many more cases. So what else do I? What else can we do? All right, so this, I'm coming down to the end of my little talk here, and I'm trying to leave room for some questions, but 
I have developed what I call a showdown procedure that I've now used in four cases. And it's, it's like the OK Corral, you know, the movie, the OK Corral. So it started, I'm going to even tell you the name of the case because it's over. It was Comcast versus uh, somebody, uh, Open TV, I think it was called. And, and uh, thir they had 13 patents asserted against Comcast, 13, with 133 claims. So, I, you know, in federal court, we have a thing called a case management conference. So I call them in, initial case management conference. And the lawyers were presenting it to me as if I had to go through 133 claims and construe them and, you know, read 13 patents and the prosecution histories and figure out what they meant and hear an expert testimony. I said, don't you, I have other things to do. And I gave them this, I, you know, I, 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 people are going to miss out on their social security check because I'm, because I can't rule on their case. So I said, that's not, there's got to be a better way. So I said, you've got to reduce the number. Well, they, the plaintiff then reduced the number to, I think, 98 claims. And I said, no, this is not good enough. So I got worked up. You can, you can tell from my person, I can get worked up. So I, I was sitting on the bench. I said, here's what we're going to do. I pointed to, Com I pointed to Comcast. I said, you're going to pick the weakest one, the one, whichever claim you want, just pick one claim. No matter what, you know, you're telling me these are all bogus. You pick the one you think is the most bogus, and you bring a motion for summary judgment on that one. And then I said, in parallel, you, uh, the patent holder, you get to pick the strongest one. You're, whatever one you want, and you bring that for a summary judgment. We'll hear it all, and we'll, I'm going to give you four months of discovery so you can make sure everyone's got discovery. Then we're going to have the summary judgment. They were looking at me with big saucer-like eyes. <clears throat> then, then I said, and get this. I get this. If the plaintiff wins, if the patent holder wins, we're going to entertain a motion for, for injunction, and your product may go off the shelf. We won't have to reach the other 97 claims. Your product will be history if the plaintiff wins. And I turned to the plaintiff, and I said, but if you lose... Maybe it's Sanction City. Sanction City. Then I spell it out, S-A-N. So they're looking at me. And, well, we went through this process. So the, here's what happened. Uh, the Comcast side picked, I give them a schedule, and they picked uh, a certain claim. And immediately the other side withdrew it. Withdrew it. In fact, they withdrew the entire uh, patent. So then... Comcast said, oh, but you remember there were 13 to begin with, so there are 12 left. So he, he so they, uh, they picked another one. Comcast picked another one. <laughs> they withdrew that one. So this happened four times. Every time Comcast would pick one, they withdrew it. So then finally Comcast said, okay, we'll just pick the one you have picked as your best one. And we'll just litigate one. Okay. So that's what they did. They litigated. They did discovery. So we get down to the hearing. It was so crystal clear. It was cliff crystal. There's no way there was infringement. So I ruled for Comcast. And then I said, sanction city. So I said, let's start the motion. Get, tell me what your time was. We're going to go through the whole process. We'll do it correctly. We're going to have sanctions for it. Not, it's not sanctions. It's exceptional. See, under the Patent Act, you don't have to have it sanctioned. It's just exceptional. Uh, so I said, this is exceptional. Your best one was no good, and so you're going to pay for what the cost so far. So that went on for about 10 days, and then I got notice, case settled, over. So I said, this is good. <laughs> I, said, I said, this one simple procedure I did have to learn, the, you know, for that one claim, but this simple procedure got right at the heart of the case. So now I'm, I, I, I have it underway now for three. This was, that was about a year ago. I've got three others in the in, in the process of, uh, well, actually, I, one of one one of them I ruled that the plaintiff uh, had 
was going to win except on one issue, and that's going to have to be tried to a jury. So the plaintiff won on, the, on their strong one, meaning the patent holder, uh, and the other side uh, won on the one they picked as the weakest one. And I, I didn't think either side deserved sanctions uh, in that case so, or, or uh, fees, so, so uh, we're just going to have a trial on the, that one issue. I guess uh, we're still that one's still up in the air, and then on the other two, they're they're in the earliest stages, so I can't report on how that's come out. Now, why is it that I bring this up? Because we struggle to find a way to to manage this. But you can't possibly think that some judge is going to have the time to to go through ninety eight claims. That would take many months with nothing else getting done. And we got people to sentence for child pornography. We got people on the sentencing guidelines for drug offenses. We got all these immigration cases. We got Title VII employment. We got all, you know, we, it, we would grind to a halt if we did 98. So you, the lawyers out there, uh, think about ways to help the poor district judge. You say, you know, let's try that thing that the judge in San Francisco came up with. They call the showdown. Well, you know, it really, it gets at the heart of the case, doesn't it? Anyway, so that's the, um, uh, the, the, the only two, these are called modus vivendi, vivendi, meaning a way to muddle through. Modus vivendi. Uh, there is no clean way to do these patent cases. And it's a plague. It's a plague. It's a plague on innovation. And uh, in, my, in my view, even though I'm going to follow the law, I mean, everyone's going to get their exactly what they deserve under the law. Professionally, when I step back and see what's going on in America, and, and that company after company, which really does invest and which really does do something good for the country and spends good hard money and get these engineers to invent something and make something work, that every time there's a success story, there are these people that come out of the and say, you've got to subscribe to our portfolio of worthless patents. So I feel it's wrong. And that you people who control the system should fix it before something drastic happens. And, all right, my time is up. I want to thank you for letting me be your speaker this year. Bye-bye. <laughs>